have days where it's like I don't know what I'm gonna do today. You end up picking up a guitar, or like getting, and you start to actually create stuff. Whereas been for ten years, it's been really hard work because I've just not had no juice. Spreading you, yourself a little too thin. Yeah. Trying to please too many people. Yeah. You know something about that? Oh, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. I really do. Yeah. Interesting, huh? Yeah. yeah. Well, it's like you love people, right? You like want to be there for them, or you feel like it's your job as a leader or like a someone who's known but if you're not there to do like the actual thing you're supposed to be there to do it sucks for everybody including especially for you so i hope you guys are rolling on that because i was <laughs> golden <laughs> <laughs> We met, you invited us to sit in your box here. I know you throttled the Titans. It was like 50. 55 to 7. Yeah. <laughs> that was a good day. And we had a spaghetti dinner. 2012. Afterwards. Yeah, it was 2012. Wow. I do remember you gave me some sort of uh, musical instrument. 74 Walnut 335, I think. Oh, that's so badass. <laughs> <laughs> you ever get, get it out? I do. Oh, I jam a little bit. What do you? with music in general, like, is it always on? Like, what kind of role does it play? Always on. I just enjoy different things at different days or mm -hmm. times of the day. And yeah, Danica will control it sometimes too, but sometimes like putting on like an East Forest station where it's like uh -huh. strictly instrumental. Yeah. And like uh, yoga, meditative type, yeah. type music. And sometimes it'll be your station or sometimes it'll yeah. be Amos Lee or sometimes it'll be, you know, Counting Crows. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah go 90s vibe yeah but it's always on i love music and yeah, you're on my you're on my you're my pre-game list too people yeah. always ask me what do you listen to before the game like to rap or something uh -huh. like i love 90s rap yeah but it's all <laughs> slow stuff i mean obviously music's a big part of what i do but also we have to listen to music before our thing too and i used to kind of like we put on like the the hypest stuff you know yeah. but it's really not about that anymore it's like you have to be get excited but you also have to be like centered and your heart can't be up no. and like yeah have to be in I need zone. stuff I can practice, like my breathing stuff, because yeah. I go through a breathing routine to really? kind of get my heart rate and my nerves at a certain level. Mm -hmm. So I can't be, you know, banging some Tupac, you right, know, right. be <laughs> trying to work on my, my breathing in, the hold, and, you know, when I'm like, oh, yeah, this thing is bouncing. Again. I remember when I was a kid, my dad was always telling me when I was playing football, he'd be like, you know, all the linemen do ballet in the NFL. And like, but there, I mean, what's changed? Like, or like, they talk to you about yoga and the breathing stuff, or is that stuff you have to like arrive on your own? I think you know that stuff is is not foreign, like on the West Coast, mm -hmm. you know, where I'm from and mm -hmm. live in the off season. That's like everybody's, you know, spiritual breathing and, and yoga on a journey. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I think the NFL is like a dinosaur when it comes to some of the uh, advancements. But I mm -hmm. think it's finally starting to catch up. The biggest change is nutrition. You know, I'm just thankful when I come into the cafeteria every day, you know, it's this huge expanse and you got a salad bar over here yeah. and you got a fruit smoothie station here and you got like three guys ready to cook you stuff over here and yeah. you got, you know, vegetable station and your meat station. Mm -hmm. In the old cafeteria, it was like soda machine, you know, wow. ice cream, uh, wow. you know, refrigerators, you know, and everybody was drinking Coke. And I remember we had this old nutritionist coming in and and she was feeding us you know, processed stuff that's not good for you. And I was thinking, man, this is, this is the NFL. Like, yeah. We're supposed to be like the high, highly trained, yeah, like, right. fittest, Machines. you know. Yeah. And that's really changed. And now wow. it's all about how nutrition affects your postural analysis and deficiencies, asymm yeah. asymmetries in your hamstrings and, your, yeah. you know, arms. Right. And it's just, wow. it's so focused on trying to get you to be at your personal best, which yeah. is which has changed. And the sleep part too. That, that Nobody really evergreen. talked about sleep for a long time. Yeah. But well you can sleep when you're dead. You don't need to sleep. Right, right, sleep. Yeah. Do you have a pregame like uh, a pre show routine? Yeah. Usually involves like either uh, <laughs> a Miller Light or <laughs> uh, or like, you know, a ginger whiskey or something like that. But generally it's just walking as much as I can. Like down waltzing. the hall. Yeah. yeah. Waltzing myself down the hallway. Yes. Uh, but no just like just getting out of your head, just trying to like, you know, do little voice warm ups or whatever. I don't really have like a. You don't have a voice coach? No. People always ask me, you have a quarterback coach? I said, no. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> <laughs>
No, I don't. I don't have much like that. We, you know, we've been doing it long enough. I mean, I used to get really anxious and yeah. was unable to control my nerves, really. So what changed it for you? Because I know for me, the breathing, you know, was yeah. a big, a big thing for me. Like just like finding out how to use your breath to slow your heart rate down. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. feel like it always like takes me down to a more centered spot where I'm not kind of outside my body thinking about negatives. Or if we yep. don't make it or if we're this going on, yeah, it's and, just, and I kind of get back to center. There's a singular task at hand. Same, same thing for you, kind of? Yeah, I mean, it's like the, you've, we've heard of the zone or whatever. It's, it's hard to get into it. You can't really describe how to get into it other than things like talking about breathing helps you get there. But if your mind's wild, if your mind's loud, and there's all those things going on, it takes a longer time. You have to start out well. And I think I just wasn't well for a number of years adjusting to my minor version of, of being well-known or semi-famous and mm. all the attention and things like that, you know? And I had to deal with therapy and stuff, like just to, to clear out all of the junk. Mm -hmm. you know, I just had to re-center everything. The therapy thing is interesting because I know growing up, I don't know how it was for you, but I think that word had a real negative connotation. Oh, you're nuts if you go to therapy. Yeah, like yeah. you got a lot of problems. I don't yeah. have many problems with that person. They're going to therapy. Yeah, you know? yeah, right. Now I think it's where it should be as far as in yeah. the, the collective thought is that it's an important part of growing. You know? Yeah. And it's asking for help, which is actually a strength. We're right in that spot too right now. I mean, like, I don't think there's a lot of NFL quarterbacks talking about, like, hey, that's okay. It's like, not only is it okay, it's like part of how you get better. Yeah. Part of having like a healthy mind and like everybody, I don't know a single person that hasn't struggled. It's an exciting time in that, that way. I think that globally or at least in our Western culture, we're opening up to things like that. And I think it's important. It's very important. You know, and I think in, in sports, you know, anybody seeing a, like a sports psychologist or a shrink was a golfer. It's because, yeah, because mm -hmm. golfers have mental the, problems. The you know, they're, they're single sport athletes. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, they're not, they're, you know, individual sport athletes. They're not team sport. They're getting their own head easily. But yeah. now I think it's it's normal for, mm -hmm. and we have one on staff, you know, so yeah. having a sports psychologist who is a therapist. You know, yeah, they, yeah. They, they're helping you with ideas to get your max performance, but they're also there to listen. You know, yeah, yeah. And to have that outlet where, you know, in a world where there's not a lot of privacy. Yeah. Like there is a right. confidentiality and when you yeah. have confidentiality you can have that that openness, that vulnerability. And I think that's how you grow really as a right. person is you know, you, you hit some sort of bottom. Well, I'm curious now, coming from, you know, you were in California and then you ended up after community college maybe you ended up at Cal, I mean and then getting to the NFL. So maybe it was a solid a solid rise to being more well known, but like you ever have a moment where you're like, I wish this could all go away, or yeah, like the attention and all yeah, that? Yeah, totally. You know, I think I, by nature I'm a private person, mm -hmm. um, and when that privacy is infringed upon, you know, kind of attacks your what you think is your structural, you know, boundaries mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think the the freedom comes when you kind of get rid of those boundaries and uh -huh. you find comfort in being, not being locked away or right. being a hermit or. Right, introvert. Because by nature, I would like to be an extrovert. I would like to be out and about. Right. I enjoy my alone time, but I think some of that fame and notoriety just kind of made me withdraw a little more, and, mm. and that's where I didn't want to be. And yeah, I think once I embraced it all and put it in the, in the place that it was, because I think our society glorifies fame and notoriety, yeah. and there's a lot of stuff that comes with it. Yeah. I didn't grow up thinking I want to be rich and famous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, I just want to be a great quarterback. Yeah, right. There's a lot of stuff that comes with it. Some yeah. incredible, yeah. and some that are tough, that yeah, you have yeah. to learn to embrace. That and you deal won't with. be prepared for no matter what. Not at all. Yeah. And then once I think I embraced those, I talked to the right people, I got help, you know, things, I think the balance returned. You sound like I've been sounding lately, because, you know, it was, it was, I struggled for a long time. I still did my job for the most part and showed up and was performing at a decent, you know, a, a level that I can be proud of or whatever, but it wasn't good. It wasn't fun. I'm sure there's days where you're like, I'd rather not be doing this, or maybe not anymore. I, I, I feel I feel much happier doing music than I have. It feels like it was before all this happened. Really, just adjusted to it, just as of like this year, the coming last couple of years, and leaning on friends, old friends, and like. To be reminded of who you are, rather than like what you seem to be, mm -hmm. what like everything's projected towards you, and I like what you said about embracing it because it's the reality. You can't run from it exactly. Forgiving yourself for some of that stuff is important too. Yeah. Right? Another game 
didn't go super well on Sunday. I didn't want to bring it up exactly, but I was thinking about this idea of like losing with confidence or something. And like, I, you know, we'll have a bad show. Like we'll have one bad show for a run. And it really isn't even my, my friend, Brad, who comes in as a big supporter of, of mine, like, you know, I'll get done with one of those shows and be like, oh man, damn it. You know, like what, what happened? Or like, I really wish we got to do this, this, and this, we got to do this. And then he's like, you learn things through your missteps. Yeah. I mean, I think in the, in adverse times, character is highlighted. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's revealed through difficult situations and are people choosing Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday of the week after a tough loss to continue to make decisions to buy in. Mm -hmm. When you have an environment that allows for guys to make decisions on their own, whether to buy in or not, you don't have uh, forced accountability. You mm -hmm. have optional accountability. I think that's the best environment mm -hmm. and an opportunity for people to grow. So when yeah. things happen and you struggle, people have the opportunity to be accountable, hold themselves yeah. accountable yeah. or point fingers. Right. To be about the team or be about yourself. Yeah. To learn from it or to get bitter or feel sorry for yourself yeah. for it. And that's what we're dealing with this week. You know, we come yeah. off a tough loss. And my whole focus after the game was we have a great thing. Yeah. yeah. I really believe that. I think yeah. we have a good group of guys. We have an opportunity to do something special. Now is the time to prove that. Yeah. Because we can't be a family and be jumping around and loving each other. Yeah. You know, and dancing and sticking together only when it's good. fun and we're winning. Yeah, right. When we lose and we play terrible, are we still going to stick together? Are we still going to be a family? Are we yeah. still going to be positive with each other? Are we still going to, you know, buy into what we're doing? Yeah. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm confident in this team that we'll, we'll be where we need to be this week. There's a lot of new energy, a lot of young energy. I've heard you say a couple of things maybe passing. That must be really exciting. I think it's been a reset, first of all, which uh -huh. has been great. You know, it's, yeah. it's new challenges. It's way new energy. It's yeah. a new vibe. You know, I've... One thing that's been really resonating with me this year is that one person or one act can change the course of your life and so many people's lives. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think this year we've had multiple people add on to the team. It's really changed the course of our squad and the direction yeah. we're going and the mindset and the energy. And it's been fun to watch. Yeah. And I think it's taught me a lot about how important that leadership timing is. Yeah, no because kidding. Because ultimately guys don't want leadership all the time. Yeah. They don't want somebody who's going to tell them all, every single day. No, they want their own autonomy they want and agency. The, yeah. 100%. And because and everybody has their own process. Yeah. Because I look at our squad, are we the most talented team I've ever been a part of? I don't think so. Yeah. But neither was the 2010 team that won mm -hmm. the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. That just, that team loved each other. And we had just, that's something special that you, you have a hard time putting your putting your hand on. I'm sure just like a, a song or a record or a show where you're yeah. just like, it's, it's that intangible yeah. vibe, energy. It's the, like you said, it's the additive nature of your personnel. You're, you know, like, I, I think about that all the time. Like, uh, uh, the musicians I've chose to put around me, I have talent and, and I worked really hard and I, you know, I feel like I deserve the stuff that's come towards me, but one of the, probably the most, the thing I'm most proud of is like the folks I've allowed to be around me and like, and the bandmates and like, we now have language that nobody else has. It's not even a competitive thing. Uh, it's just, we're able to speak deep. It's more about like just vibing. I think about teamwork and teammates and all my experiences with sports growing up is as super vital. You have to let everybody find their own footing and, and have the confidence to try something and make a mistake and know that, that it doesn't matter. And there, there's just so many parallels that I've found over the years. It's like you've stepping back and observing and like letting letting people get get bigger. Also, we're all tight friends and there's times that you don't want to get your friendship in the way of having, you know, just being a leader or something mm. like that. And I don't really have to walk around being like, I'm the leader. Um, I, I feel supported or whatever, but yeah. I resonate with that surrounding yourself with the right people and you're mm -hmm. proud of that. Like that's one thing I am. I am proud of the, you know, the people that are in my life are there for a reason and they've yeah. really supported me in the right ways. Yeah. And they, they've made themselves very clear on who those people are. Even when you got the best of friends, you can still feel isolated in your situation, of course, in your situation and being well known and kind of having, having your squad on your back and all that stuff, um, or, or figuratively. But you know, for me, it was just like friends, 
friendship and like people that are willing to say the thing that isn't just going to make you feel better. Mm -hmm. You're like, hey, I'm not judging you here, it's, but maybe you need to look at this. Maybe we can look at this. Like, I'm a little worried about you in this regard. Holding your friends accountable and being held accountable can break those patterns as well. Hearing somebody else say something and not just like this inner dialogue constantly or mm -hmm. it can be very, very beneficial. <laughs> And I was sitting around talking about what are you gonna ask Aaron Rodgers and stuff. And I, one of the cool things in the conversation came up was like, one day you won't be the the quarterback, you know, of the Packers and and you know, Hall of Famer like like Favre kind of gave you got the ball from him and you were able to create new history, you know. And I was wondering if you've ever thought about or if you could think about what you'd say to that person. To the younger me or to the next to the guy next following? to the next guy like the next guy up maybe you don't like thinking about that these days. no I, I mean how do you not yeah yeah you know, yeah I think that's that's part of it you have to be a realist and realize you know Favre was here and they traded him away Jordy Nelson got cut John yeah. Coon got cut Charles Woodson got cut it's a reality I think that could happen hopefully I can you know play four five six more years and and right off in the sunset but that type of finished your careers hasn't happened a whole lot. I mean, right. think about those players who can do that. It's, you know, Brady, it's Kobe Bryant, it's Tim Duncan, mm -hmm. it's it's not many Derek Jeter, it's not many people who can start and finish and be iconic for a franchise yeah. for a long time. So I think the biggest thing is that I learned along the way is you just have to do it your own way. You know, you can't try and be the other person. You have to understand guys are gonna respond to authentic personality and authentic leadership. The only thing that matters is who you are, who do your teammates think you are, yeah. and will they follow you? Yeah. Because all the other stuff is just BS for you know news mm -hmm. stations to mm -hmm. talk about and have one guy on one side say this, he's terrible, he's never gonna figure it out. And yeah, the other yeah. guy say, oh, he's gonna be even better than yeah. Rodgers and Favre, you know? And yeah, yeah. None of that stuff matters. All that matters yeah. is those guys in the locker room. Yeah. Do they love you, do they believe in you? Are they gonna follow you, are they gonna mm -hmm. listen to you? If not, you don't have a chance. Yeah. If they do, then yeah, you got a pretty good chance. I feel like that's a general note for all of, all of us living, like just living in our society, it, it, that it's not really about what other people think of you. You only can kind of count on the how you were, how you acted, and and your ability to like see past a lot of those. I think that is legacy, though. That, really that, that in of itself I think is that legacy. Is, that's the only true legacy. The other stuff, the records, the yards, the stats, mm -hmm. that's stuff that's gonna get broken. You know, when, yep. when Farber's playing here, he broke the all-time touchdown record, so yeah. now he's third yeah. or fourth, yeah. you know? Yeah. The legacy, the true legacy is in 20 years, how many of those guys are you still talking to? Right, no kidding. How many experiences have you had with those folks mm -hmm. since then, and do you keep in touch with them? Was it just about achieving some sort of monetary or personal yeah. status? Yeah. Or was it about like to somebody else other than yourself? Making yeah. meaningful relationships. Yeah. In the midst of playing. That's what I always say to guys. I said the playing thing is unbelievable. And the passion I have for it, I love competing. Mm -hmm. But like if we're just doing it just for that or for the money or for like I think we're missing the real point. The real but point. if we are making meaningful relationships and impact mm -hmm. with your teammates while we're playing, I think then we're truly Doing it for the right reasons. Yeah, man. Well said. I'm happy to hear you say that. The guys are lucky to have you. I'm lucky to have this sport. I feel that way about music myself. But it's like my religion. It is like my way of thinking and feeling and understanding myself and, and uh, my environment around me, you know? I feel lucky about that. When you are thinking about writing, yeah. where do you, what gets you in the mindset and then what do you, what's your process for that? It's a good question and it's, it, it's good you ask now. I mean, like after what we've been talking about today, I. I haven't been in the mindset. I've had to really just sit in the studio for years to get songs, to create enough material to turn them into songs. Whereas growing up, I was just sort of in that normal creative place and inspired. There was no pressure. It was just feel, feelings. And so I'd sit down and just songs would just fly out. With the touring going so well and this, this last album coming together in a very collaborative sense and the team, our community, the Bon Iver, like squad, if you will, feels so healthy and challenged and we're operating at a high level really. And it's because I've been able to relent and get, get rid of, you know, a lot of my decision making or all, you know, needing to be too hands-on of a leader or, or any of these things. And I'm just sort of feel like I'm one of the, 
one of the cogs in the machine. And now when I sit, when I go home, it, the silence is not deafening. I can, mm. There's actually something I'm hearing in my head. Mm. There's something there that I can kind of pull at and, and see what comes out of it. And that hasn't happened since before all this happened to me. So where did 22 a million come from? 22 is like my lucky number. Yeah. Like it's just like your number. I don't know if, if you have that relationship with 12 or something. I but do. It, it, yeah, and it's just like that's it. That's my number. I don't know why I like it so much. I don't know why every time I look at the, the clock, it's that. But since I was a kid, it was just like that was my identity. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Or like somehow that was me. You know, they, they didn't let tight ends wear 22 in my high school around the wishbone but at basketball i tried to wear it you know and anytime i could and got tattoos of the number 22 and just had love of it and the concept of that really is if 22 is me the singular number this really low number this you know a number you can kind of conceive of and million or a billion is is something you really can't conceive of it's it's the other i just i really like thinking about as much to do with it what the my new album is about too the new album, it's just the, your relationship with other people and the world and how when they're in tune, there's more power than them when they're separated. And mm. you know what I mean? And, and uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think that's it. And, and you can't have one without the other. It's like you don't, you know, in, when you're feeling like you ha are isolated or like you're alone, as much as you feel like that, or as much as you might want to be alone or disappear. You just aren't. You, you and, and in times of being happy and supported and, and you have joy and peace in your life, you didn't get there on your own either. And I think that's, that's very much to do with kind of that concept, you know, being, being one and then thinking you're, you're only that one singular number in sitting next to, to the others, the million other people out there, or in this case, seven billion people on earth or whatever it is these days and then the new record i and i is what i call it and it's this rastafarian concept that i learned about when i was a kid listening to the gobs and gobs of reggae music and in the the rastafarian religion is it's i and i it's i i we're both we're both here we're both responsible for one another and we are kind of in reality sort of part of one large organism and one thing that is responsible for itself and I always like that concept it's a humbling thing whereas in some some religions or some just ideological situations they it's binary, it's a, it's binary exactly yeah. it's like you yeah. have to, you are the one and it's that's tough for me to swallow when I just look around it at human beings it just doesn't seem like that's how we I don't resonate with that idea yeah me neither man me neither so why is the I and I why now would you say I can't really conceive of the things that I'll do in the future, uh, and and in a way I can't really understand looking back why I created the things I created when I created them, and that's kind of an exciting way to look at it. It's you're, oh. you're where you grow. To answer it further, though, I think in many ways it was about it was the fourth record. It's ten years in. The team around me has become the team. You know, I'm not the only one driving. We got other people driving. We have other people that are looking after the health of the entire organization and the family. And, and those family members are all equally important, including me. And so it was a highly collaborative record. You know, it was like we were down in the desert in Texas near the border and we were just, we set up for like a month or six weeks and just collaborated. And it really felt like, you know, everybody in the squad had a chance to come through and to, to touch the essence of the record. And coming from my first album, which it was very solitary, and there's a, there's a part of me that maybe thinks I might return to a little bit of that for my own my own good, but this season uh, it's just accumulated. I'll call the album the season, the fourth season of Bon Iver, the TV show. Uh, it, it's just more about the about all of us mm. and and like the the collective, you know, the sum of our personalities and our love for each other and all that. That's awesome. Yeah. That's a good answer. Good. <laughs> Thanks. So you've released four albums now. Does music just keep on going, or is there an end to it at some point? With all the joy and like healthy amount of playing and a healthy amount of, with getting the balance going, I don't want to stop. But you can kind of you can kind of be wheelchaired out there when you're 80 and drink a beer and still kind of do it. I mean, hey, your career has a longer <laughs> lifespan, I think, than mine. <laughs> <laughs> the Rolling Stones. Yeah, right. Still, yeah, 
I, I don't know. I want to do it forever. So that's that's easy. <laughs> the Green Bay Packers are pretty huge for me. That's a big interest of mine. But it's pretty much yeah, music and the Packers. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my my uh, career, I'm definitely on the on the second half, back half of my career. I mean, I've played 15 years. I've started 12 now. Yeah, I'd like to get to 40. I think that's mm -hmm. kind of a benchmark number for me. It's changed. I think you didn't see a lot of, you know, growing up. I think Montana retired at 36 or 7, same as Steve Young and Elway. And getting to 40 was like a rarity, you know. Mm -hmm. And Jeff George came out of retirement for the eighth time to play for the Raiders at yeah. 41. I was like, oh, my God, he's yeah. so old. Yeah, know? yeah. Where Warren Moon played till he was 44, started a game for the Chiefs. That was like an absolute anomaly. Yeah. But now with Tom, what he's doing, and obviously Drew. But I do have a lot of other interests. You know, I am a lover of music and also, you know, some of the other arts, uh, movies and documentaries. I always thought it would be fun to be a part of some of those edgy documentary projects that mm -hmm. are interested in causes and concerns that really affect um, people every single yeah. day and being a part of some of those will be fun. Yeah. Um, you know, I love traveling as well too. Yeah. And when you get out there and you see the world, you know traveling over the world. Yeah. Some amazing people out there. Yeah. And they, they might they, not look like us or yeah, talk yeah. the same language, but there's a common language and it can be music a lot of yeah, times. Yeah. Have you got favorite spots you've been to that you want to go back to or spots you are thinking about getting to? We went to New Zealand, and I, I said that's a place I could live. Yeah, man. Trying. We're going to New Zealand, I think. I think for the first time? Yeah. <laughs> Which, uh, uh, Which part? Where are we going? Auckland. Au Wellington. We've been to Auckland. No, we've been to Wellington. Okay. <laughs> Damn it. I know, I, every time we've gone down to that part of the... We, we didn't get to New Zealand right away. But we've been to Australia a number of times, and every time I've gone down there, I've stayed. And I'm usually ready to get home, ready to get back to the quiet and Eau Claire and all that stuff. <laughs> the, and pickle. the pickle. <laughs> no, the pickle is definitely not there no more. It's not? <laughs> no. Oh. Sorry to burst your bubble. No burst way. Your <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Pretty impressed. It's, it's, it's still there? Totally there. Oh, it's still there. Yeah. Come on. Oh, dang. <laughs> Maybe I blocked it out of my memory. It was something right. before the, pi the the pickle. It was something else. Nasty habit. That's what's not there anymore. That was like 13 years ago. Oh, man. Because I remember in 2006, it was definitely still there. I go to the joint still. It's my parents. That's across the street from the pickle, and that's oh, where my parents. Oh, competitors. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. They don't, you know, my parents met there, so I have a certain loyalty okay. to Next the time homies. in Eau Claire, definitely in the joint. But yep. I might have to stop in the pickle just for a second. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> Speaking of nostalgia, I've always wanted to ask you what Holocene was about. Mm. Good question. That's maybe my favorite song. Oh, yours. cool! Yeah. I it was Christmas. It was Christmas night. My brother and I watched Inglorious Bastards mm. uh, of all films. You know, it's not like it was a, a subject matter that was you know gonna birth a song like that exactly. But it was so, you know I like watching Tarantino's films because they're so complete. There's just complete creative ideas executed at such a high level. You know and. We had a little smoky smoke and took a walk down our road and it was so quiet and it was like a really icy night and it was already quiet because there's not a lot of people traveling and it was really kind of spooky night. The air is just hanging and we went and walked over to this bridge over I-94 and there was just wasn't a single car. There was nothing for miles and miles and the air was hanging in such a way with the ice storm kind of going on and it, it looked like this, this sheet of ice on the, on the road and this glow of the distant lights of Eau Claire. And it was just, it, it really just came out. Like at once I knew I was not magnificent, you know, in the highway aisles of ice and, and all that. And it was one of those moments where you're not sure if you're really the creator of something or not, or if you've just been handed something to, to share. It's easy to stay humble sometimes when you know it's like, you know, I've worked hard and everything, but sometimes you just feel like you're, you really are a conduit for describing an idea or something like that. But that's really where that all came from and the different verses are really about Eau Claire and about my people from from there and you know there's a lot of humble people around and growing up in Wisconsin I never felt like anybody was really trying to prove too much you know the winter slows us down enough that you know we're not Hollywood we don't seem to think achievement is the biggest thing it's like family and togetherness and and having a beer at the joint or whatever you know it's more like that and I've always resonated with it and it's another one of the reasons I can't seem to 
to leave. But yeah, that's that's the story with that. That's pretty awesome. Cool. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. Heck yeah. There's a gif of you a couple of years ago from the preseason of you wearing a, a Bond shirt. No, this is what it was. Uh. We had we had the Giphy Day. I have literally probably fifty gifts wearing that shirt. Yep, I know about it. Them. They're all yeah, they're all like if you if you look me up in the little drop down box. Yeah. Probably half of them are me wearing your shirt. Yeah, <laughs> I've sent them to. It's a, a little few small. Months. I might need, you know, <laughs> I need to go on the website and get some more swag. <laughs> you play some six string. I heard. Um, what's the kind of stuff you play? I, I do enjoy playing guitar. When I was drafted, I wanted to buy for myself. I wanted to buy a truck because you need one in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. and a guitar because I always wanted to learn how to play guitar. Mm -hmm. And so I started teaching myself, and then ended up taking some theory lessons down the street here. But I do really enjoy it. I think my best playing has been for choice audiences, you know, <laughs> towards the end of the night when there's been some drinks had. Yeah. You know, I got a couple, you know, some, some go-tos I can get to that, that people enjoy and sing along. And what, do you, what do you play? You got to tell me. Wagon Wheel is a go-to. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Like Solid. People enjoy that. But most of the time I stick to some chord progressions, you mm -hmm. know, just keep it C, D, G, A minor. You know, uh -huh. Keep it in the grass. <laughs> yeah. Every now and then throw in a little D minor or something. But... <laughs> E minor, maybe. Uh -huh. if I'm really feeling saucy. But the first song, <laughs> no, the, the first song I learned to play was uh, Forever by Ben Harper. In college, I would hang out with my roommate and we just listened to the Double Life from Mars over and over and over. And mm -hmm. I always said, if I ever get a guitar, the first song I want to learn how to play is Forever. That's awesome. You ever think about starting a band? No, when no, you retire? no, 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 no. I'm not, like I said, I'm. I'm good for a choice crowd. Okay. <laughs> and I can, you know, go on my tabs app and download some, you know, and look up some stuff and find the one that, you know, is capoed at three where I can just play C D G or yep, something, you know yep, what I mean? To yep. keep it keep it simple and I hate bar chords. I'll always put a capo on there. Yeah. If I can if I can help it. But I do enjoy. I love music in general and I have a ton of respect for those musicians who actually play their own music mm -hmm. and write their own music. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm drawn to more People, I would say, I don't know what you would describe your genre as, but you know, singer-songwriter stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, just mm -hmm. that, that's always got me. But I haven't written anything that I would ever share with anybody. Mm -hmm. And like I said, but I you don't, have written. You I've, just told I've me. tried a couple okay. times, but well, you can share. You can share with me, you know, because I always no, say, no, no, help no, you no, finish no, no, off this tune or something. I don't want to finish any of those off. That was, <laughs> that was back when I was in my early twenties, writing about silly stuff. <laughs> Oh man. Well, if you ever pick it back up again, I'm, I'm here for okay, you. Okay, yeah. I'm here for you. It's Best a, football movie. It's Remember the Titans for me. Rudy's solid, though. Yeah, I watched Rudy a bunch in, in college. I had this 17 inch TV with a built in VCR player, which kids these days have no idea what that is. <laughs> and I would alternate Tombstone and Rudy. <laughs> and then my my quarterback coach for a long time in the league, Tom Clements, played at Notre Dame and told me a lot of that movie is BS. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh no, Rudy, don't ruin yeah. Rudy. Yeah, yeah. It's like, what about the Vince Vaughn part? Yeah. When he throws, t no, that didn't happen. No. Okay. <laughs> Damn. What about carrying? What about putting the jersey down? No, didn't nope. happen. No. Nope. So that one kind of dropped a little for me. <laughs> um, I would say, again, based on nostalgia and when this movie came out. Varsity Blues mm. is kind of my favorite. I love Remember the Titans. The program is a good one, I think. I don't know the program. Yeah. Um, I thought Any Given Sunday kind of sucked. I, the personally. speech is used a lot. Yeah, you know, it's The true. speeches we it's have true. in life. Pacino just, it, it's, he was too handsome or something. or I don't know. Just. I thought too Jamie did a good job. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah I thought Jamie was good. He's athletic, too. Yeah. I, mean, I think, you know, that's what... Uh, the remake they did, the Burt Reynolds one, Longest Yard, mm -hmm. like they said, Nelly did a lot of his own stuff for that movie. And mm -hmm. it's, in it's interesting to see like some of these actors or musicians, their athletic prowess, which I'd love to see yours at some point, mm. being a you know former <laughs> high school athlete. Um, I still play hoops every once in a while, yeah. but I am moving. I'm moving slow. Just old man game. Yeah, old man. Gets back a to the basket. Baby hooks. Mid range. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no threes. Like to rebound. Yeah, mid range, mid range. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, like just to... take a step in from the three point. Yeah, line. exactly. Ten footers, lost tops. Art. Yeah, that's what I'll keep saying to myself is that I'm a lost art in the basketball floor. <laughs> I Set do love screens, the game, help defense. Yes. Yeah. Getting boards, p outlet passes. Oh, yeah. I'm usually playing with kids a lot. I go down to the Y. I haven't been playing as much the last couple of years, but I started back up again. And it's just fun. They're they're fast, and I'm old. 
Uh, old man strength, though. Yeah, right. Well, and also, you, the old man game is uh, your feet don't leave the floor a lot, and so you you learn to use your movements strategically. You know, a lot of, like, under, you know, little yeah. scoop shots or whatever. <laughs> like, people's hands are always up. It's like, might as well just be lazy and do the scoop shot or whatever. <laughs> like, that's where I'm entering into the... Into the I'm a big hook shot guy. Like yeah? Yeah, hook shot. Yeah. Like full sky hook or like baby hook shot? No, full sky Oh, wow. Yeah, Kareem. Yes. Get it out there. Yeah. We got a hoop in our team meeting, and guys are always giving me because, you know, I don't want to, these guys are up there, you know, doing their shot and stuff, yeah. and I'm just hook shots. Yeah, see? So you got to practice the finesse part of the yeah. game, too. Vladi Divac, man. Oh, yeah. Vladi Divac smoked cigs during <laughs> halftime. Oh, yeah. That is so badass. I actually thought of that because... When we when I we went to the Grammys, which was a very very stressful, panicky kind of situation for me, it was just bizarre. I was so stressed out, and I was smoking a lot at the time. And they brought like after you get an award or whatever, you just like get funneled back into this area. And I was end up in this locker room, and I didn't ask anyone. I was just like, well, Vladi smoked in this locker room. <laughs> Vladi did it. I'm gonna light up in here. Yeah. <laughs> That's I a great love. justification. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, every year the goal is the Vince Lombardi Trophy, named after our longtime coach, obviously. For you guys, is the goal a Grammy? Or I mean, I know what you've said about the Grammys, but is it <laughs> is it the Grammy or is it something else, or is it just mm -hmm. meaningful music? For me, I've always differentiated the competitiveness in music, and I find it distracting. You know, in sports, the the competition's the very truth of it. That's the entire point. It's like two opposing energies fighting mm -hmm. with music i find it almost like a an emotional commodity for the world uh, or like this universal language that i i found the awards and stuff distracting to the original purpose and i've said some pretty gnarly things and angry things about the grammys and stuff before I, i'd take i'd take them back just because why you know have a trouble with something that's so simple or whatever and and just don't participate if you don't want to participate but i do find it distracting and i think that people forget that like music's actually here to help or to to heal or to inspire or to like get you through your day it's just here as a commodity an emotional commodity is what i always think and so i think the, the competitiveness of it distracts me i'd rather i'd rather watch the packers play for that part of my you know you know what i mean was that just anxiety or was that well that that you felt like you didn't want to be recognized with people who maybe didn't view music the same way that you viewed music. I wouldn't have thought about it like that then, but I think that was probably, you know, I was like uncomfortable in that place because I wasn't sure other people had the same feelings I did. I thought to myself, you know, I'll take a stab at, at seeing how this feels. I didn't feel comfortable. When it's done, I just walked out. Nobody recognized, you know, I was just like in the Staples Center. It's not like I was like brought out some secret passageway. I was just like there. Nobody remembered me. I was up in front of everybody. And the whole thing was just odd. And so I don't know if, you know, I, I mean, I'm acting like I'm just, it's automatic. I'm going to get uh, nominated or something again. But it, it, it's just not in my mind. It's not something that's a part of the, the goal structure. It's not why you do it. No, not at all. See, that segues into my answer. You know, I want to be a quarterback when I was six years old sitting on my living room floor watching Joe Montana, mm -hmm. thinking that's what I want to do. And then I think once you get into it and you realize how special the opportunity is, how different it is than what you thought when you were a kid, how there's so much more to it. You know how you have 80,000 fans of your game every week and 52 of your best friends, you mm -hmm. know, in those moments to play with. I think sitting on that bus, I was like, man, this is amazing, but this cannot be it. Yeah. They cannot be it, meaning all of it. Yeah, life in general. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for me, I was like, man, I want to win another one of these for sure. But I always want to remember that feeling of there's got to be more than just this trophy I'm holding my hands. Yeah. And to me, I think that's when I first realized that that bus was it. Yeah. Those guys on the bus. Mm. It was those guys on the bus next to us. Mm. You know, that's what it's all about. Yeah, and that's why I say what I say. I think if you if you're just playing for that, or the fame, or the money, or the glory, or the Grammy, mm -hmm. or the fame, or whatever mm -hmm. you know, notoriety, mm -hmm. or to be recognized in Staples Center, yeah. you're doing it for the wrong reason. Yeah, because you will never have the impact you ever want to make, mm -hmm. or you won't be for the right reasons. Yeah, and that's why I try and tell the young guys, you know, the goal as a team is to win a championship, but the goal for yourself should be to make 
meaningful, lasting, impactful relationships mm -hmm. and to grow as a person. Yeah. Because I think when you do that and that is your focus, that this is way more likely to happen. Exactly. Because when you have 53 people who know who they are and they feel comfortable being themselves and they're connected to their teammates, that's the only way the other thing can happen. Whenever you know we're having a, an argument or, or trying to figure out a song or something, it's like my bandmate Mike has, says it really well. He's like, we're, we're talking about a music song right now. Mm -hmm. You know, like, let's put yeah. it into perspective here. Like, let's not lose our shit over this. Like, let's, like, let's figure this out. You're so right. I love what you said, that when you're calm and you're, you have easy feelings and it's all in perspective, you're not, there's no pressure. It's just go, just move, do, do everything you've trained your whole life to do. Flow. Flow. Yeah. Mm, absolutely, man. I have too many tattoos. Uh, you have any, or would you want to get one together, or? <laughs> together? <laughs> I have zero tattoos. And but I, get one. How many do you have? I don't know. I've lost track now. Guess. 30 some? Some are parts of others that I don't remember when that <laughs> one was got. And now I've got like my buddies comes over and just gives me stick and poke tattoos. I met some kid backstage who was just working at the venue, Sammy Slacks. Shout out to Sammy Slacks. And he's just like, hey man, can I give you like a guitar or something? I was like, I don't know. I said, give me a little devil on my calf. And he ends up giving me this humongous devil that I would have never chose, you know, but it was fun. <laughs> so you have no regrets about any of the tattoos? No, you can't. I mean, no, that's part of it. And once, you, once, you, once you're past, like, the four or five tattoo situation, then, it's just like you're downhill. Now and then you're like, it really doesn't matter what it's going to look like when, I, when they put me down in the ground, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot I just got a, a basketball, like, on my leg. I found it the it's other day. It's for the Y. Like, yeah, it's for the, it's for the Y homies. But I was like, I completely forgot I had that. It's like on the back of my leg, it's just a basketball, not like a cool, like weird, trippy basketball. It's just a basketball. Yeah, I don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> maybe when you retire, you get like a huge dragon on your back or something. Two dragons, man. Two dragons. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is really fun, man. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah, really, really, happy really. Happy for really, you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. You too. Yeah. I'm happy, most happy, I mean, not just for your insane success and prowess out there, but it sounds just the things you're talking about is like, that's the important stuff. That's what I meant for you as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, man. Thank you. Mm -hmm.